Welcome to the cross mantle interaction discussion. Today, I'm going to discuss melintal derived melt migration pathways through the lower crust. This work was done with my collaborator Sandra Piazzolo from the University of Leeds and some PhD and master's students. And the work we're proposing to do in the future is with Steve Foley and Heather Handley here at Macquarie. This is a summary of the key findings of our work so far. In order to look for melt migration pathways, we've focused on microstructural and microchemical fingerprints. These include microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt and hydration and rare earth element mobility and metasomatism associated with the melt migration. The field observations have shown us that sometimes we have a recognisable igneous component and sometimes we don't. Our goal was to enhance our understanding of mass and heat transfer. The example that I will show is from Fiordland in the South Island of New Zealand. Back in the Cretaceous 100 million years ago, this was a Cordilleran arc environment. It's a natural laboratory where we can study melt migration pathways because we have exposed the deep lower crustal root of a magmatic arc from 40 kilometers deep. We see little retrograde or deformation overprint. We see lots of melt flux features and we have excellent exposure. The older exposed magmatic rocks in Fiordland are shown here in red and the black dots on the strontium versus silica diagram at the bottom are from our study area in the Pembroke granulite. These older rocks show a typical arc flux rate of around 14 cubic kilometres per million years per kilometre of arc. The younger parts, shown in green and blue, formed over about a 10 million year period where there was a flare-up event and that flux rate increased to greater than 100 cubic kilometres per million years per kilometre of arc. Our research question was to look at the effect of the open system and reactive melt migration of these high strontium mantle derived melts through the older red pieces of crust. I'll talk about three melt migration events within the Pembroke Valley. The first is a diffuse porous flow where we interpret melt migration along grain boundaries through relatively static or low deformation crust. The original rock is a 2-pyroxene parkasite granulite. It shows lots of evidence for undulose extinction and solid state deformation of the earlier igneous and metamorphic minerals. Overprinting those are some static coronae involving amphibolan quartz or amphibolan plagioclase. The coronae are variably developed throughout the valley from at the top of this slide showing low development of the amphibole coronae through to the bottom where the pyroxenes are pretty much completely replaced. The key feature of these reactions is the hydration to form the amphibole. We mapped a couple of key samples at the Australian synchrotron and focused on strontium in the plagioclase. The two centre diagrams, C and D, are showing you maps of strontium, note the scales are slightly different, the yellow areas of high strontium we interpret as marking melt migration pathways, the red arrow in the bottom diagram. These high strontium melts are interpreted to leave behind a high strontium imprint on the plagioclase. In order to convince the reviewers of our work that melt was involved in this hydration, because most of them immediately jump to the conclusion that the hydration is driven by influx of aqueous fluid rather than melt. We took a firstly microstructural approach. We looked for evidence of the former presence of melt based on the microstructures. Some of the key ones are shown here. We see some very small volumes of plagioclase, K feldspar and quartz that might indicate crystallization of a former melt pocket. We see evidence for wetted grain boundaries and low dihedral angles less than 60 degrees that are indicating the potential pseudomorphing of a former melt. We see films in Penalee around former biotite 
and the albite content in some of our plagioclases increases towards the rims. All of these have been presented in the past as microstructures indicative of the former presence of metal. We see chemical changes in the major element chemistry of the minerals with this interaction, but the most convincing feature for the reviewers of our work was the rare earth element profiles. At the bottom of this slide, the pargacitic amphibole, which is our new amphibole forming in the coronas, is relatively enriched in the rare earth elements compared to the reactant plagioclase and pyroxenes. This increase in the rare earth element content and the uniform character of the rare earth element content regardless of whether it replaced diopside or enstatite was quite convincing for the reviewers of our work that melt must have been involved because rare earth elements are much more mobile in melt than they are in aqueous fluids. So the key message for this first part of the talk is that the hydration textures we see in this part of the lower crust are not related to retrograde reactions. We interpret them as pervasive flux of a hydrosilicate melt through the lower crust. We've recently completed some experiments where we took some dry gabaroic rock to pyroxene plagioclase and we reacted it with a hydrous version of itself. The hydrous gabaric melt reacted with the dry gabbro to form coronas of hornblend amphibole around the pyroxenes in a very similar texture to what we see in the lower crust natural rocks. These textures developed very rapidly, the experiment was only 12 hours, and the only chemical potential, the only difference between the gabbroic rock fragments and the hydrous gabbroic melt was that we added water to make the hydrous gabbroic melt. The second event of melt flux through the lower crust is a brittle event. Here we can see a grid pattern of thin feldspar rich dipolites and adjacent to them are some garnet reaction zones. I won't say much about them here because there's been a lot published on this particular uh, set of rocks, but it overprints the first story I just talked about. In detail, the thin dipolites that are rich in those coarse garnet and plagioclase you can see in the center of this diagram, they have a few centimeter wide garnet reaction zone around them where that early formed amphibole is actually dehydrated adjacent to the dike. Some of the dikes, many of them, show very thin septum at the center that we interpret as representing the closure or collapse of the dike. Cutting across these key structural markers are other dikes. Here in this picture, we can see a relatively pegmatitic coarse white dike cutting across. Either side of it is a hydration reaction zone, where the earlier garnet reaction zones are now being hydrated and the earlier plagioclase rich dikes are forming these trains of garnet or garnetite layers. The scale of these features steps up to a meter scale, where along some of these dikes we can see this hydration either side of the dikes forming these interesting wing-like patterns along those earlier garnet reaction zones. And then this process steps up to being focused in shear zones. And so many of the shear zones that cut the Pembroke Valley are also hydrous. The first example I'm going to show here is an amphibolite. It's basically plagioclase plus amphibole rock. There's no recognizable igneous component. We don't see lots of leucosomal dikes inside these shear zones. We see typical banding, fabric gradient, change in color, change in grain size, a new foliation and lineation, and a deflection off a fabric that all indicate these are a ductile zone. The largest of these shear zones is 30 to 40 meters wide and dominated by hornblendite. Panels B, C and D are showing you the progressive replacement of the earlier formed rocks towards the shear zone and into the shear zone. You can see that the grid pattern of garnet reaction zones gets replaced by a grid pattern of garnetite in hornblendite. Panel E is showing that some parts of this shear zone are pegmatitic, 
where there's coarse amphibole, shown by the white arrows, plagioclase by the red arrows, and garnet by the yellow arrows. The geochemical data within this shear zone shows us that there is significant whole rock rare earth element metasomatism. Some parts of the shear zone are hornblendite, and some parts of the shear zone are clinozoazite bearing hornblendite with up to 20% clinozoazite epidote. The rare earth patterns for these different rock components are quite different to the original gabbroic gneiss host rocks. In thin section, the host has a strong metamorphic character about it, with a nice foliation, evidence for crystal plastic deformation. Once we get into the shear zone, intuitively we might expect to see a lot of deformed minerals, but what we actually see is a very igneous nature of the high strain rocks. The top panel here B is showing us an example of the garnetite with hornblendite, and the bottom panel, panel is showing us the garnetite with the clinozoazite rich hornblendite. The backscatter images, D, E and F, are showing us the microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt, these very interstitial textures, films along grain boundaries, low dihedral angles. The texture of these rocks looks very much like an igneous cumulate type texture with igneous microstructure. But from the field relationships, we know that this is in a high strain zone. And so the model we developed here was to talk of flux of an externally derived hydrosilicate melt that's in disequilibrium with the gneiss that it's migrating through. The migration's happening in an active zone of ductile deformation, in this case 30 or 40 meters wide. As the melt moves through this zone, we see dissolution a type of grain scale magmatic assimilation of the precursor rock. The melt is crystallizing hornblende with or without clinozoazite and garnet from that melt migration event. These are similar to the hydration crystallization reactions that Beer described in the early 2000s. The processes that are happening within these pathways of melt migration are chemically equivalent to AFC. The assimilation is happening through this grain scale magmatic dissolution process, and the fractional crystallization is the hornblende, clinozoazite and garnet crystallizing from the melt. And so as the melt moves through in stage one in the cartoon, it will be changing its chemistry as it reacts with the lower crust as it moves up. After a certain proportion of melt flux, once the rock has largely reacted away the host nice, and we're left with a hornblendite or a clinozoazite hornblendite, the melt is probably able to move through in a relatively armoured channel. I think one of the key features of this particular part of the study is that when we see an ultra basic rock in the field that are very common in the lower crust, it doesn't necessarily mean that they form through a cumulate process or an intrusion of some sort of basic to ultra basic magma. These rocks, I think, are in fact the geological expression of localized channels of melt flux in the lower crust. I think these are the key sites where melt has moved up through the crust. While initially reactive, these channels are sites of geochemical evolution of the melts. And so when we see signatures in our more shallow crustal magmas and volcanic rocks, the kind of chemical signatures that indicate amphibole was crystallizing at depth or garnet was crystallizing at depth may in fact be happening in this sort of environment as melt reacts through the crust compared to moving through and happening in a magma chamber. One of the key features of these high strain zones is their microstructure is quite different to a classic myelinite. In the field, these shear zones look like a myelinite from their field relationships, but in thin section, they're very different. So here I'm showing just a picture of a typical 500 degrees Celsius myelinite from the web. And on the next slide, I'm showing what the thin sections of these high strain zones look like in the Pembroke Valley.
we don't see the bimodal grain size distribution that we see in a classic myelinite. And many of the other microstructures here are quite different to what you find in a typical myelinite. I think this microstructural pattern is an excellent indicator for melt flux through the lower crust. So how can we recognize if a shear zone transferred melt? First, field observations. Sometimes shear zones are still quite rich in leukocratic material that people use to interpret that it was a melt present deformation zone. In the Fiordland lower crust, we didn't really see much of that, and so we had a lack of field observations that would support our interpretation. So therefore, we had to rely on the microstructures, and these microstructures I've shown you are atypical of a classic myelinite deformation zone, but they include microstructures that are indicative of the former presence of melt. These melt pseudomorphs, they must crystallize at the end of the deformation story in order to be preserved in the rock. Once the melt crystallizes, the rock must become hard, such that those microstructures are preserved through to today. We see these hydration, crystallization reactions, where here in the lower arc crust, we're producing dominantly amphibole with a little bit of mica. And one of the key features chemically is that we see evidence for rare earth element mobility and metasomatism within these zones. So one of the questions in terms of future research that I have is how important is reactive migration of melt through the crust in all igneous systems? Thank you. I'll open up for questions.